And without any further delays, I'd like to hand over to our chairperson for today, Patrick Mitchell-Fox. Good morning, everyone. Um, yes, as Elliot says, I'm Patrick Mitchell-Fox, Senior Analyst and Wholesale Insights Specialist at IGD. And I'm very pleased to have been asked to chair this uh, event again this year, um, after last year. Hopefully that means I didn't block my copybook too badly last year. Yes, thanks, Ella. Thanks for, so much for the invitation. Um, anyway, everyone, welcome to the JJ Food Service Supplier event um, with the theme, Delivering a Gold Standard Sustainable Service. It's going to be a great opportunity for you to get close to the business and to hear more about its strategy and its culture of innovation and sustainability, as well as to understand some more of the context in which it's operating in terms of market, customers and consumers. So between now and 4.30, across four sessions, you're going to be hearing, hearing first from a range of industry analysts and commentators. I'm first up, lucky you. Um, and then uh, after coffee, after that session, we'll be returning to hear from some uh, from key players, uh, key members of the JG Food Service team that will really help you get under the bonnet of the business and to really help you understand what's going on in terms of projects and plans uh, for, the coming, uh, for the coming next year uh, and the years beyond. Um, just immediately before we break for lunch, there's going to be a Q&A session where a panel of our speakers will be discussing uh, the, the issue of transforming the customer service experience. Uh, then lunch follows, hooray. Um, and then following lunch, we'll be back again for a, a program of speakers, supplier speakers, who will be sharing their insights on, on how they have been working with JJ Food Service to deliver uh, on the sustainability agenda. After following a, another little coffee break, We'll have one more speaker from JJ, this time from the marketing function, uh, and they will be sharing how they are delivering uh, cutting-edge marketing for your brands in the food service channel. And then we're saving the best till last. Um, we've got a great keynote speaker at the end of the day, Richard Knight, who is Customer Service Director at Insight 6, the national specialist in gathering and activating on customer feedback. And I'm sure we're all going to have something to learn from his presentation on the subject of transforming the customer service experience. Um, so it is great to see you all to hit, uh, great to see you all here today. Thanks so much for making taking the time and, and taking the effort. Really, obviously, particularly the effort given everything, all the hurdles have been put in our way over the last couple of months. Um, but I think I can really say that I think the investment in time and effort in being here really will be rewarded by getting you close to a business that I see as really being cutting edge uh, uh, at, at the real cutting edge of UK food service wholesaling. Um, my colleagues often tease me as a wholesale, wholesale specialist saying, oh, you know, wholesale so old school sort of thing. But I always point out, JJ Food Service, JJ Food Service is emphatically new school, definitely new school. I say, if ever you want to see what wholesalers are going to be doing in five or ten years' time, look at what JJ Food Service are doing now. Um, so really, it's a question of today. If you understand, want to understand what the future looks like, um, uh, pay attention. Um, but don't take my word for it. Um, I think the hard numbers actually always tell the real success of the JJ business. Um, basically, this looks unremarkable looking graph perhaps, um, charts JJ's course through the last four years and particularly through the last two years of, of the pandemic basically. Um, and what's remarkable about this is hardly missed a beat basically in 2020. This is a sector that went off a cliff basically in 2020. Uh, so most businesses in the channel went off the cliff. Some recovery in 2021, not so JJ a modest dip in 2020 and then come roaring back in 2021. And really what that means, to really sort of underline it, is uh, while everyone else was actually seeking to look to return to their levels of 2019 sales from the pre-pandemic period, JJ Food Service was already 18% of where it was, 18% ahead of where it was in 2019. And that actually means that it was actually over 40 percentage points ahead of the market average. That's absolutely, that's a, that's a scary level of outperformance, in fact, a, a really truly remarkable performance. Across the market as a whole in 2021, we did see some recovery. As I said, we got a real significant drop off in 2020. Basically, this market average was 10 times the level of, of drop that we saw at JJ Food Service, followed by a 22.4% recovery to a value of £8.7 billion pounds, uh, you know, so at, at uh, wholesale cost uh, in 2021. Still a long way off what we had in 2019 um, of 11.2 and far 
nothing like enough to actually counteract that minus 36.5% drop that we saw in 2020. Um, you wouldn't have known it from JJ Food Service, but 2021 was, by all the indicators, still a very heavily COVID-impacted year. Um, and so it is in the data, the other data that we collected around the performance of the sector for 2021. Um, this is the uh, category performance data, broad categories against 2019 for 2021. And you can see, yes, obviously, uh, pretty much to see a red across the board, basically. Most categories down fairly substantially. Ambient and fresh, uh, ambient and fresh chilled and fresh food down at about the level that the whole sector was. Um, but the things I'd pull out on this chart, um, the one circled there, frozen food, basically. That is a relative outperformance in this marketplace. Frozen food was the more resilient category, um, and it shows that people, operators in the channel, were switching out of, of ambient even, and children fresh in particular, and into frozen as a way of managing the risks around the uncertain demands, and actually, indeed, whether they were even going to be allowed to go on trading from week to week, effectively. The other ones, the other d details I'd pick out on this chart are actually the, the, the drinks categories in the middle there, which are really disproportionately depressed uh, versus the rest of the market. We saw that in 2020 as well. Uh, essentially, yes, the, the, the whole sector is down, but drinks in particular, the sector was really moving or pivoting towards supplying people by delivery, moving into delivery areas. So drinks particularly through the wholesale channel, not a great uh, a sort of big part of most of those transactions. So disproportionately affected by the fact that home delivery was actually supporting the channel, in fact. Um, and that's also borne out to some extent by the one category that actually we see uh, a level of growth in terms on 2019, which is the non-food consumables. That, of course, includes takeaway packaging, basically. Um, so that's where that sort of uh, uplist has come from at that takeaway packaging and also uh, you know, obviously cleaning uh, and hygiene products, which people are obviously spending much more on as COVID continued to circulate. Another aspect that we saw uh, a sort of emerge in, in 2020 uh, was a shift into what we call self-service purchasing, basically. That would be cash and carry or click and collect. Um, it's not a huge shift, but it is a tangible shift, basically. Um, and it's been driven by on the one hand, customers looking to, uh, you know, trying to ensure availability, you know, shopping around, can't find things one place, can't get on delivery, pop down the cash and carry, find it there sort of thing. There's that influence going on. And then there's also the fact that basically people are wanting to purchase in smaller quantities. When, you're, when your demand's uncertain, you're purchasing in smaller quantities. You, can't, you don't necessarily want to actually have to hit the minimum purchase order to secure a delivery. So, you know, you're going to go pop down the cash and carry. You're going to go by some other means, basically. Um, that is something that's borne out, really, if we look at a range of other wholesaler performances uh, over 2021. This is a whole series of wholesalers sales for 2021 versus 2019. Um, and if you look over to the far left-hand side of that, the business has probably done best in these, um, obviously still a long way behind where JJ is, actually, in fact, um, is Booker, Booker Catering, which was almost back at 100% of its 2019 sales in 2021. Um, obviously, that's the major cash and carry wholesaler. Um, the rest of these guys, almost exclusively delivered uh, operators, so entirely dependent on delivery fundamentally, uh, and obviously all the way down significantly further, worse outcomes, basically all the way from eight to down to minus 44%. That's actually a really wide range, actually, really. And I've been asked, you know, so why such a wide range? Obviously, you know, the same things, weren't they affecting everybody? Um, but I think, actually, there are several, several factors going on here. I think, on the one hand, it's product mix. On uh, another hand, it's actually customer mix. And then it's also about geography, too. Um, the one I'd point out all the way down here, Reynolds, which obviously is, is JJ Food Services' close neighbor in Enfield, actually, in fact, um, is a fresh produce specialist, short lead times, high-end customers, and probably a very big stake in particularly the central London uh, catering market, you know, servicing casual dining, high-end dining, and all those sorts of things. Um, the ge geographical aspect of that, particularly being focused around London, uh, I would draw a contrast with this business here, Arthur David, which is, a, again, a fresh produce specialist uh, based out in Bristol. Um, they're, they're obviously not a particularly great year. I'm significantly down on 2019, but 
obviously not anywhere near as far down uh, as Reynolds. And the reason for that, I think, is actually it's access to those, those, uh, those markets, those customer bases in, in the southwest. You're talking, uh, you're talking Somerset, Devon, Cornwall, which actually did really well in that big staycation summer that we saw in 2021. So regionality, locality has been a very significant influence um, on, on what's been going on in the marketplace. Um, and I mentioned London. Uh, and it's been an ongoing theme uh, that I've heard both from commentators and businesses that central London in particular has been very slow to recover in terms of its uh, marketplace in the eating out sector. Um, and this is really being borne out by a whole range of bits of data. There's some great tracking data that's come out from the pandemic, basically. This is the uh, Google Mobility data tracking presence at workplaces. Basically, they track where people's mobile phones are, basically, and then plot it on a nice big, well, I plot it on a nice big graph, but they give you the numbers. Um, this goes all the way from the beginning of 2021 to uh, actually the 15th of October, which is sadly actually when they terminated the data, which is a bit unhelpful. For an analyst like me, I want like, you know, a nice long sequence of data. But anyway, it's just enough really to show us we're pretty much up to where we are now. Uh, I've got three lines on the chart. Total UK in workplaces, Greater London on the green line, and Tower Hamlets. Chosen Tower Hamlets because obviously a borough of London. It's where um, Canary Wharf is. So it's a big commuter destination in terms of banks, financial institutions, that sort of thing. Um, obviously, you can see the whole of the UK ends at minus 22. Still not particularly far back. You'd have thought it might actually be further, further back uh, in terms of recovery, in terms of workplace presence. But London, obviously, significantly worse, down to 30%. And then Tower Hamlets down even further, um, uh, sort of on minus 33. Um, and that's something that actually is being also borne out, that very slow recovery in London, borne out by some great data that's made available by uh, Transport for London um, on basically counting the number of oyster taps in and out of tube stations across the capital. This particular chart is for the 15 stations in, in the city of London, basically. Um, and you can see, obviously, yeah, it goes off a cliff, recover, 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 but actually still actually quite a long way short, even at the peaks that we get. Uh, and these, each, in, each, in, uh, each individual line is a day. Uh, so those peaks are still significantly lower than they were back before the pandemic, basically. And then the other aspect of this data, actually, is how you're getting these, these dropbacks, this, this comb effect, basically, uh, throughout the data, which really is obviously, yeah, you've guessed it, basically, people are still working from home. They might be going into the office one, two, three days a week, but they are staying home for a certain part of their week. So that's creating that, that impact. Um, and that variability um, across the week, day by day, is also borne out if you actually take a specific week. So what I've got there is the week, uh, week commencing 2nd of February 2020, before the pandemic or even before the sort of panic of that pandemic started to, to, to rise, and then the latest week in that data, which is week commencing 20th of November this year, basically. And you can see, basically, across a whole week, it's still down. That, tra that traffic is down. There's, well, the number of taps is down by 1.5 million, roughly. Um, 28 percent down. It's, it's similar order of magnitude to the Google mobility data, in fact. Actually. So I think actually this is quite quite striking that there is some kind of thing, you know sort of those two sort of um, things are of similar similar magnitude. Um, but what's also worth pointing out is actually obviously in terms of the individual days always lower, but actually also in terms of the variability across the week. So the busiest day, both before the pandemic and after the pandemic, actually is always Thursday. Um, and here you go. If the slackest day of the working week is actually Monday. The gap there both is bigger in now, in both in percentage terms and in actual terms, basically. So that sort of, you know, that seesaw effect throughout the week, um, very striking uh, of, of effect uh, that still uh, persists um, in those locations in, in central London. Now, obviously, uh, the lack of commuters in London or the shortage of commuters in London obviously is, is, means that the, the eating out sector has fewer potential customers. Swilling, swilling around, around, in around these locations. Um, and obviously, it must be affecting quite a lot of businesses, but I've certainly heard that some are actually doing quite well in, in, spite, of, in spite of this effect. But there are obviously businesses who are specifically focused on catering in business and industry locations that actually this is much, much more problematic for. Um, this is a, a, the business uh, Baxter Story, uh, a division of of uh, the Westbury Street Holdings Group, which also runs things like Benugo, for instance. That's their sort of high street brand, if you like. But this division is specifically catering to coating to offices, is catering to corporate headquarters and all that sort of thing. Uh, and as you can see, obviously, it went off a cliff in 2020, but still worse, 2021, actually, you get further decline, decline on decline, basically. So what it's suggesting in that sector is really that the, that the effects of the pandemic 
and pushing people into working home has actually been progressive. Um, and actually, a sort of recovery from this sort of situation, I suppose maybe there won't be a recovery, maybe we'll never actually get back to where we were, but it's certainly going to be quite a lot slower, a quite a lot a longer process than, than for many other sectors. But it's true that many other sectors are doing okay um, and actually outperforming what we might see as the, as the level of recovery. Um, this is the data um, that my colleague Nicola, I think she should be here today, I'm not sure she's in the audience yet, but anyway, she, she's uh, leading our uh, research stream on the eating out sector. And basically, this is the total value of food in the eating out sector, 2019, 2023. Obviously, you can see it's steadily uh, recovering, um, plus 15% on 20 uh, in 2022. And I'll draw your attention to this particular this green one. You may not be actually be able to see the number. I can't hardly see it. I have to get quite close to it. Um, but that actually basically indicates that, that that number is ahead of the 2019 number. So, And that is QSR. That is what we would otherwise know. That would include things like fast food and things like that. That is a particularly sweet spot for, for JJ Food Service, I would say. So, um, you know, it's a very strong place to be, to be operating at this point in time. Um, and that sector actually is growing ahead of the market, so it's actually gaining share. That sector is now accounting for over 25% of all spend uh, in the out-of-home sector. Um, now, I mentioned growth, and I mentioned growth of 15%, but I think at this point in time, we can't really talk about growth without going, oh, inflation sort of thing. It's pushing up prices all around us. Um, it seems an ever-increasing rate. Um, so really, what we have to say is that 15% is not real growth, basically. That 15% is probably somewhat lower in terms of real growth, given the rates of inflation that we're seeing. Um, I can't be that specific about exactly what those rates of inflation are at this point in time, but um, the Office of National Statistics come up with a, very, a range of, of, of indices, and this one is for restaurants and cafes, uh, and then the latest data out to October. So for the 10 months of October, it's running, inflation, they say, is running at 6.9%. So obviously, if that runs, that stands for the whole year, take that off 15, you end up about 8%, basically. And obviously, if it's accelerating, that will be slightly slower. Um, so inflation is a caveat uh, about growth, I think, on, on the market at the moment in particular, because it's at exceptional levels. Um, I think the other thing, uh, and the more pernicious effect of, of uh, inflation on the eating out sector is, of course, actually the way it's likely to be, to be depressing demand. Uh, consumers are more likely to be saving money on eating out than they are on quite a few other areas of their spending. So I think what we're looking at into, into next year and possibly the year beyond is actually what you might call pressure on, on the eating out market's share of stomach. Um, my colleague Nicola has done an analysis where basically we've stacked up uh, it's the retail spend in food, on food and then the out-of-home spend on food. Uh, obviously, back before the pandemic, it was, it was 37 and 63 um, get to 2022 and it's 29 and 71. Uh, and while out of home will recover further and grow in value terms into 2023, we're saying that basically it's going to, the share of stomach will actually shrink. Um, retail, probably the more resilient of the sectors. It's more about uh, less discretionary purchasing typically. People are less likely to cut back on their food before they cut back on other things. Um, but then there's also a very specific trend that we've seen, and it's been developing over quite a long time, but I think the, the retailers are going, really going to be putting their foot on it uh, in the coming year or so, and that's about actually targeting spend from the food service sector, from the out-of-home market. Uh, and we all see, see a whole thing. So the, the term of fake-away became, became quite popular in, uh, in, over the pandemic, uh, and sort of you know, brands like this one, which is actually a Tesco exclusive, uh, in fact, there are features here in a budget store called the Pizza Company. Basically, you can see that that is basically pitching at Domino's. Basically, that is not. There's no whole. There's nothing. No mincing on that. Really, they're looking to take away uh, a sort of uh, uh, as a competitor, saying we can do it. We can do it as good, uh, and we can do it significantly cheaper. So that's a very significant challenge, I think, that's going to be coming from the retailers. So that's me, basically. Uh, but before I turn back to my chairman role, I should just say that I think we know that the year is going to be a tough one. The, the next year or so, 18 months, is going to be tough. Um, I think, though, there are always businesses that actually excel in the downturn. Um, and I think companies with vision, companies with resilience and flexibility, like JJ Food Service, I think, will be in a good place to actually build and maintain momentum going forward. And of course, in the, in the course of today, we're also going to be hearing much more about uh, the, the sort of JJ's focus on longer term agendas, such as sustainability uh, and climate.